Good morning, everyone. I'm Carrie Gruby Leibarker, the administrator and consumer advocate for the South Carolina Department of Consumer Affairs. Welcome to our presentation on our homeowners association complaints that we have received over the last five years. We just have celebrated the fifth year anniversary last month of the law that requires us to collect certain information on homeowners association complaints. And so we decided to do a special report that was in addition to our annual report that we issued earlier this year uh, to kind of compile all of that data and see if we um, can see trends and just um, kind of call that data a little bit more specifically. All right, so the presentation itself is not meant to be a substitute for reading any various laws that may be discussed, requesting a legal opinion from us or anything like that. We're just trying to give an introduction and overview for the materials for our homeowner association complaints. The question we often get is what role do we play with the, we'll still call it new Homeowners Association Act. It's only five years old, so that's still relatively new out there. Um, there are a lot of laws introduced, a lot of bills, I should say, introduced every year dealing with homeowners associations. And with this one, it was amended several times. So people were confused about what our actual role was. And then there continued to be bills introduced. I think there were eight homeowner association bills that were introduced during this last legislative session that just ended last week. I don't believe any of them got a committee hearing, um, but we'll be talking briefly about those. I think it's next month we have a legislative update webinar that will just kind of touch on the subject matter of those, but it didn't look like there was much movement there. But with the current law, we're gonna talk about what we do here at DCA. So we take homeowner association complaints. Um, so we had taken homeowner association complaints even before the law passed, but there was, we just went through the, the regular voluntary mediation process. It was like any other complaint, a business didn't have to respond to us or anything like that. But the law specifically says we have to take those homeowner association complaints. And not only do we need to take those complaints, we have to collect certain specific data. And those are some of the data points we're gonna go over today with our five-year report. And then we're supposed to share data, an annual report with the General Assembly by January 31st of each year. And then we're supposed to provide education to homeowners and homeowners associations. What we do not do is administer the Homeowner Association Act. Uh, we are not the ones who administer or enforce the act. So if somebody does not comply with its provisions, we are not the ones um, who can go in and tell somebody what they need to do. As a matter of fact, the law specifically says we cannot arbitrate a dispute. It is just a mediation of a complaint process. Um, so there's usually the uh, necessity of getting an attorney or going through the general voluntary mediation process if you're trying to get uh, a resolution to that complaint. So how does a homeowner association know what they can and cannot do? So there are some applicable state laws, the Nonprofit Corporation Act for those that are registered as nonprofits, the South Carolina Horizontal Property Regime Act for those that are condos or kind of apartment complexes, and the South Carolina Homeowners Association Act. And then the homeowner association governing documents, that declaration, master deeds, bylaws, rules and regulations to include the covenants, conditions, and restrictions, those CCRs. So the CCRs usually limit how a homeowner can improve or use their property, and it covers landscaping, building standards, guests, pets, things like that. And then the Declaration of Master Deeds usually talk about the rights and responsibilities of the members and the homeowners association. So that can include the meetings, the dues assessments, um, things more along the lines of the governance of the association. So that's generally where you get the regulation of homeowners associations. And again, not a whole lot of state agency involvement in ensuring compliance. With those, it usually has to occur in a private action or through magistrate's court, um, which where you don't need an attorney. That's part of what the Homeowner Association Act did as well. So you can file a complaint with our office at consumer.sc.gov. Even though we don't have the ability to arbitrate complaints or take specific enforcement action, um, you still potentially could get a refund credit or adjustment, get the documents that you may be looking for if that's the, the concern or the issue, the repairs and the maintenance that you may be wanting to see done may get done. Um, just generally your issue may get resolved uh, if, you, if you file that complaint with us. And then that information will be put into our annual report to go to the legislators so they can identify if they want new laws or amendments to the homeowner association regulations if they think those are warranted or needed. 
So we can't force a homeowner association to participate in the complaint process. Um, there is some good news though that I'm gonna I'm gonna go over for our five-year report kind of related to that. And then of course we can't require a specific outcome or do that attempt to dispute. But we also encourage you to contact your legislator directly with any concerns that you may have. And you can do so by going to sdstatehouse.gov and it has the find your legislators box there at the bottom where you can put in your information if you don't know who your current legislators are. Okay, so with all that about who we are, what we do and what we can't do, we're gonna go over our homeowner association five year report. So the data contained in this report, it's coming from the five annual reports that we've issued so far. So the law went into effect, I think it was May 17th, of 2018. So beginning June 1st, we had the program up and running again to where we had the, um, the data set up, the form set up so we can collect that data that the law specifically requires us to collect. So in that first half year, we compiled all that data into the first annual report that we issued, which was issued on January 31st of 2019. And then every year after that, we've issued reports that contain data for the particular calendar year, that prior calendar year. So from June 2018 to December of 2023, we received 1,182 complaints involving homeowners associations. But only 1,012 of those complaints were actually reported in those annual reports. So 170 did not make the cut, and that could be either because the they did not meet the statutory requirements for inclusion, um, which mainly usually means that the supplemental questionnaire with that specific data that we're supposed to collect for each complaint was not submitted with that complaint. Um, there could have been duplicates or there could have been a couple that we referred. Usually our referrals for these go to the uh, Human Affairs Commission because it may be discrimination and housing issues. So with the 1,012 complaints reported, there were 640 homeowners associations involved with those complaints and 208 had management companies. So this is our complaint per county data. So this is just the outright number of complaints that were filed with our office per county. The darker the county is, the more complaints that we received. I think it was 27 counties that we received complaints uh, from regarding homeowners association. There were 46 counties total in South Carolina. So 27 we had complaints from you can see along the coast, we have a, a high number in the Midlands, right there in Richland, um, which is number two. Horry County takes the top spot uh, by far. And then Richland had 165 filed, and then Greenville had 83, Charleston had 82. Um, so you can kind of see just that overall number. So Horry, Richland, Greenville, Charleston, and Beaufort were your top five over those five years for the number of complaints. Then we broke it down per capita. Um, because, you know, some like Richland County has a lot of folks living in it, right? And so does Charleston and Greenville. So we decided to do per capita per 1,000 folks. So how many complaints were filed per 1,000 um, residents? So Horry County still took the top spot with 0.74 complaints filed per 1,000 folks, then Jasper at 0.66 and Georgetown at 0.60. So your top three per capita all came from along the coast. There were some surprise ones, like we had McCormick, um, a rural area with 0.42. They only had, I think, four complaints, but there's not a lot of folks that live in McCormick County. Um, so that's why the per capita comes into play. Um, it's interesting for us to see those trends. All right, the top three types of issues raised overall were failure to adhere to and or enforce the covenants and bylaws. So this took about almost a quarter of the um, complaints. And just to kind of put a caveat here is when a complaint is filed, there could be more than one issue that is raised in that complaint. And so we're looking at all of the issues overall um, that were identified. So failure to adhere that include, can include board transition from the de developer to the residents, that they're not um, complying with the process laid out for that. The board elections are infrequent or off cycle. That people are being told that certain um, violations are occurring, but those violations are not um, in the covenants and bylaws. Then we had 13.54% for our second 
issue, our second most popular issue, which was concerns regarding maintenance or repairs. So oftentimes that's the lack of maintenance or repairs occurring or the cost associated uh, with it. And then the third category at 11.22% was failure to notify residents of board actions. So that could be um, open meeting notice requirements, things of that nature. So those were the top three issues raised over the last five years but we do have in the report the top 10 complaint concerns overall. And so you can see those items and then there is a chart for each year. So it's a chart for 2018, 19, 20, 21, and 22 that show the top 10 complaint concerns for those particular years within the report also. So complaint closings. So this is one of the areas that I wanted to mention. Um, because we had only, I'm going to focus on the um, unsatisfied category at the very bottom. So we only had 4.57% of complaints closed unsatisfied. And generally that means a business just outright did not respond to our office when we sent the complaint out. This is a sharp decline from the complaints that were filed from January 2014 through May of 2018 when 13.2% received that particular closing designation. So we certainly think that's a positive that has come from the law. And then we had, let's see, undetermined was 13%, and that is dealing with disputed facts. So increasingly we're seeing a number of complaints that have complex issues where folks are alleging misappropriation of funds or some kind of financial related concerns. People are trying to dissolve the homeowners association. Um, so those items, we close out as undetermined and usually there's litigation or some kind of uh, attorney that gets involved for those afterwards. So we had 4% that were closed consumer satisfied, so the consumer got what they wanted. 59, almost 60% were closed adequate business response, so usually the homeowners association is able to point to covenants or bylaws or some kind of supporting documentation for whatever action that they are taking. Referrals, again small amount, usually over to the Human Affairs Commission. Information, folks are just making us aware of a certain event. There's no response that's required really from our office. Duplicate complaints, people sometimes file the same complaint more than one time, and so we exclude those, and then um, abandon. And so that is where the majority of those are closed because the person who's filing the complaint does not submit that HOA supplemental questionnaire that's required for us to get those certain data elements that the statute says that we must collect. And a very small um, portion of the complaints, I think it's less than 1%, are abandoned after we do get that information, the complaint is sent out. So part of the supplemental question air data is going to be shared with you right now. I didn't put in all the items, I put in as much as I could, but I think there may be one or two questions that I had left out. But one of the questions is, were you informed of the requirement of membership in a homeowner association as a condition of homeownership? And thankfully, 82% of folks said yes, 11% um, said no, and 6% did not answer the question. This is part of the Homeowner Association Act made an amendment to the property disclosure form that has to be completed by a seller for residential property that now has to indicate um, whether or not there's a homeowner association on the property. So that's probably helped out with this issue. Then we asked if folks have received a copy of the governing documents. Again, the majority of them said yes, which is great. We would like to see it closer to 100%. That's still pretty good. And then we wanted to know, okay, you have a homeowner association, you have the governing documents. Do you understand your rights and obligations under the governing documents? So it looks like there could be some room for improvement there. A little over 77%, almost 78% said yes, they do. Um, and 15.5% said no, and almost 7% didn't respond. Another question that's asked is whether or not folks have communicated their concerns to the HOA or the management company before filing their complaint with us. That's something we encourage across the board with any kind of complaint that people file with our office because it could be very easily resolved within the homeowners association or with that particular business if they know what the concerns or issues are. And a lot of homeowners associations do have an internal track for dealing with complaints. And if your homeowners association does not, we certainly would encourage you to do so because uh, a lot of times people just want to be heard. Uh, they just want to be able to voice their concerns and if people can come to the table and understand each other's side, it makes it easier, it's faster, it's a more efficient 
way to resolve the issue if, if people can come around a table. Um, so we certainly encourage that attempt at least. So then there are questions that specifically come from the statute as well regarding the governing documents and the provisions therein. So the statute says we have to gather information of whether the homeowner agrees or disagrees with the provisions in the governing documents. So we have 51%, almost 52% said, yes, they agree with them. Almost 38% said, no, they do not. And then 10% did not fill out that particular question. And then we're supposed to ask, do you agree or disagree with how the provisions were enforced? And so the majority disagree in that particular category. Another question we statutorily must ask is whether or not the homeowner agrees or disagrees with how the provisions, well, we did the enforcement and then whether or not they have recommendations or feel more or less enforcement is needed. And so we asked those two questions. So 58% said that more enforcement is needed, 30% disagreed. And then when we flipped the question for less enforcement, you had 23% said less and 61% said they disagreed with, with less enforcement. As far as the recommendations go for enforcing the government docu governing documents, state agency oversight was the number one recommendation there. Uh, that was actually the number one recommendation in all five uh, years of reports. Dispute resolution process within the HOA was another one. So 22% of folks, again, just having that gateway for folks to bring concerns to the, the homeowner association and having them heard out could be a good way of um, stopping folks from filing a complaint with us and making sure that everybody feels as though um, that they understand everybody's position. But again, just that they're heard out, that they that their their concerns have been have been heard. And then enforcement of provisions through magistrate's court, 17%, which there are certain items that can be heard uh, through magistrate's court related to homeowners association. Some folks requested an ombudsman, some have other, which the other recommendations can be um, seen in the reports themselves, it's a personal recommendation, it's kind of a free um, a free space that folks can, can write stuff and it may just not fit into a specific category that we already have. All right, so that's the supplemental questionnaire data. And then recommendations for changing provisions of governing documents, open meeting or notice requirements was number one. Again, we have that other category. Setting parameters for viewing and copying documents, forbidding the HOA to place liens or foreclose, set or change developer transition of control, and then some folks didn't know any whatsoever. So you can find our reports by going to our website at consumer.se.gov, hovering over news and clicking on reports, and then it's under the complaints reports tab. So if you click on homeowners association reports, it'll take you to that page where you can see background on the law, um, whoops, went too fast. You can also get to our education page for more, for more information on the Homeowners Association Act clicked here. That goes to our education page. Um, you can also make recommendations. If you have any content or process Im improvements, you can email them to our office or submit them by snail mail. That's where the special report is gonna be loaded. After we get done with our presentation today, it'll probably be up this afternoon because we're gonna put this video linked to it as well. And then it has the current report information, which is the 2023 Homeowners Association Complaint Report. If you want to get to our education page, it's at consumer.se.gov slash HOA ed, or you can go to Consumer Resources and either click on Housing and Mortgages or Help for Homeowners. And on that page, we have the laws and we have little ditties on each law, just kind of a one pager that goes over some of the highlights there. We also have the link to the report page, and we also have contacts that may, you may um, that could be helpful to you during the, the process of your complaint or to answer any questions that you may have relating to homeowners associations and the laws. And this is some of the educational ditties that we have on the Nonprofit Corporation Act, the Homeowners Association Act, and then some frequently asked questions that we get about homeowners associations. You can always follow us on social media, check out what we're doing and hear the latest. Now I'll be happy to answer questions regarding the five-year report. Okay, 
So we've got two questions that have come in. Uh, the mm -hmm. first question uh, is specifically about our ability to investigate complaints against HOA board directors. So uh, will SEDCA investigate complaints against HOA board, board of directors not hired by the HOA management company? Uh, what public resources are available other than hiring a private attorney? Yeah, so you can file a complaint against your homeowners association, whether or not they have a property management company or a homeowner association management company associated with it. You still have a homeowners association board of directors that's in place too. So you can still file a complaint against them generally. Um, as far as investigating individual board members and things of that nature, it is a voluntary mediation process. Um, is what it is. So it's not that we send folks out and gather, you know, records and issue subpoenas and, you know, things along those lines. It truly is, you file the complaint with our office. We make sure, we'll read through it, make sure we understand it, see if there's any kind of supporting documentation that may assist us to understand your complaint as well as the homeowner association to be able to understand your complaint. Um, it could be receipts, it could be copies of the governing bylaws or minutes from a board meeting or, you know, things like that. We'll forward it on to the homeowners association for their review and reply. And then once we receive their review and reply, we'll take a look at it and make sure that it addresses each one of the items that were raised in the complaint, the concerns that were raised in the complaint, see if they have supporting documentation. If not, we may follow back up with them again so we can get the full picture on all sides of what everybody's stance is and then make a determination from that point is what the next steps are. So that's the process in a nutshell. So if you have specific concerns about your homeowners association and the conduct of a particular board member, we would recommend that you take it up internally within your homeowners association first, because y'all vote them in, right? Um, so there, that would be kind of the first step and to see if you do have a formal process for mediating complaints or taking care of complaints within your homeowners association to go through that. Um, there is a magistrate's court link to where you don't need an attorney to go to magistrate's court, but I think it's monetary disputes of $7,500 or less dealing with the homeowners association, which this does not seem like uh, it would fall into that. So outside of that, it would be hiring a private attorney. Okay, so um, two questions have come in that are similar. Um, so we can kind of answer these together. Uh, so how do we get the data for this report? Uh, so um, this person is uh, wondering how did we compile the data uh, mm -hmm. and they're on the board for an HOA and they weren't canvassed directly. So they're wondering right. how we got it. Sure, so all the information, I was trying to see if I had anything on the slide. If I were more savvy, I might pull up our website to show. Um, all the information that we gathered comes from the complaints that were filed with our office regarding homeowners associations. Each year, we issue a report. Let me see, that's on. Okay, so this kind of shows um, the current report. So each year we issue a report in Excel format. All of the reports are categorized, filterable, and in a searchable format. So you can search by homeowner association, you can search by county, you can search by particular issue. And so that is what the report is, is a gigantic Excel spreadsheet for the complaints that were received during any given calendar year. And then we do an executive summary. So all of those Excel spreadsheets, those reports and the executive summaries can be found on this reports page. And all we did was combine all of that and filter it through to come up with the, the data that we have from those reports for this particular five-year anniversary. So what consumer organizations are trying to influence legislators to strengthen HOA compliance, if there are any? So I'm not aware of any groups in particular that are lobbying legislators for increased laws or um, more regulation in the homeowner association area. I know that particular regions, um, consumers, I mean, a lot of times it's individual consumers that are reaching out to their legislators and making them aware of particular issues. I know the legislators out of Horry County are very aware of the issue. Um, and I think they were 
very much behind the current HOA law or trying to get some kind of HOA law in place um, that ended up to be what we currently have. The media as well, the news media in Horry County is also all over this topic. So consumers will often contact the media to try and, and put a push um, behind, behind them. So I'm not aware of any specific consumer groups that are lobbying exclusively for homeowner association regulation. And I was going to say too, just to go back to the other question as well, when the question about the report data and stuff, we didn't do a survey. So if you have internal complaints and things that go through your own internal HOA process, that's not data that we have. We only are dealing with data that comes into our agency uh, through the complaint process. Uh, are homeowners entitled to know specifics of how money is spent within their HOA and like how much money is on hand um, or like how assessments are decided and things like that? Mm -hmm. So usually the assessments and things of that nature should be in your bylaws. Um, and then as far as the additional information, it depends. So if you are a nonprofit corporation, uh, as a homeowner association, you've, you've also filed as a nonprofit corporation corporation then there's more that has to be complied with as far as um, transparency I would say and even with the horizontal property regime act two like if you're in a condo they are very specific on certain items so it would depend on the type of homeowner association that you are if you're neither one of those then the likelihood is that it should be contained in your governing documents um, whatever your rights and responsibilities are there I can answer this next one. Uh, somebody asked, would it be okay to post this presentation on Nextdoor for folks who uh, have not been able to attend? So we actually are going to be posting this on our YouTube channel and we will be posting this on Nextdoor because we are on Nextdoor. You might have found us on there <laughs> and might have found this webinar uh, invite on there. So we will be posting our this full webinar on our YouTube channel shortly probably either this afternoon or early tomorrow morning uh, the full report is up on our website now and we will be sending out a press release with a link to the report page and the youtube channel um, early this afternoon so if you're on our subscriber list you will be receiving that um, so you don't need to post it we will be posting it to all of our channels and everyone will be seeing it so it will be there um somebody says do poas and hoas fall under the hoa act so there's a definition of a homeowners association contained within the act itself i don't know it off by heart um if you want to give us well i'm telling you right now if you go to this website the complaint reports page we have a link to the law right there the section 27-30-340 that lets you know who it applies to I think it's a pretty broad definition. Uh, I know it excludes timeshares, uh, but that's the best that I know. If there's another question, I can try and look that up pretty quickly. If you wanna move on to the next question, I can come back to that one. Yeah, so our management company is not doing their job. What, our, what are our options? So I would look at the contract that the homeowners association has with the management company um, to see the parameters for cancellation there. And then whatever your internal processes were for hiring the management company. Is it a vote um, of a certain, you know, a quorum of folks that vote for the management company and, and things of that nature, likely something that you'll need to bring up at a homeowners association meeting. Um, but looking at the contract with the management association and your own um, procedures for the selection and choosing and contracting of would be where I would start. Carrie, while you look that up, I can answer um, these next two questions because they have to, they pertain with the actual report themselves. So this okay. has to do, um, are the report results per HOA available and can HOAs, um, can't we have HOAs administer like surveys or reports from within? So. The report results are available, uh, as Carrie has mentioned, they're on our website. So every single year we have them in um, Excel format and they're fil filterable. We have instructions on the reports page that's up right now on the screen of how you can filter through those. So you can look at every single year, every five years is on there. So you can look through that. 
Um, and again, we don't administer the HOA Act. So we cannot tell your HOAs what to do. Um, if you are, if that's something you would want your HOA to do to administer surveys on how you think things are going within your HOA, I would suggest reaching out to your HOA and tell them that, um, if that's something that you think should be implemented. It's not something that we could do, but if that's something that you are interested in, I would suggest reaching out to your HOA. Um, <clears throat> let's see. There was something else I was gonna add to that and I forgot what it was. The surveying, surveying. Ugh, maybe it'll come back to me. All right, I have the definition of homeowners association. So it's a little long, so y'all buckle up. Uh, for it. So, homeowners association or association means an entity developed to manage and maintain a planned community or horizontal property regime for which there is a declaration requiring a person by virtue of his ownership of a separate property within the planned community or horizontal property regime to pay assessments for a share of real estate taxes, insurance premiums, maintenance, or improvement of or services or other expenses related to common elements and other real estate described in that declaration. A homeowners or association does not include a vacation time sharing plan organized and subject to the provisions of chapter 32. So that's the, the broad definition of a homeowners association. Any other questions? Yeah, some of these questions are getting really specific. Um, so we, what I'm going to suggest is uh, we will follow up with these individuals who have very specific questions to their HOAs. Um, well, and, and let me preface that with saying we might not be able to answer your question. I mean, we can point you to the specific laws that may govern um, your particular homeowners association, again, depending on if it's a horizontal property regime or if it's um, a, a nonprofit or things of that nature. But because we do not administer or enforce those related laws, we can't issue opinions or interpretations or tell you that somebody has to do something. We can do what we just did and kind of uh, guide you to where you should go to look um, for potentially the answer to your question. Somebody asked, will the Q&A be included in the video when you upload it to YouTube? Yes, we'll include it in the, the upload. Um, for, and I think that's the last question that we have that isn't very. Oh, I see one. That's a good one. Okay. Um, that I think is broader. Where they said if counties, if two counties are involved in a homeowners association, can there be conflicts in county laws or regulations? So <clears throat> there are some properties that, cover two or even sometimes three counties, just the way that our county lines are drawn. So there, I don't think that there would be particular rules or laws governing the homeowner association itself. Um, the Homeowner Association Act talks about how you have to file your um, governing documents with the Register of Deeds and things of that nature, but I'm not aware of particular county law or regulations specific to homeowners associations. Maybe they do exist. Um, I don't think it's an area that counties are prohibited from putting rules in place for, um, but I think they're few and far between. But when it comes to certain building codes or um, the maintenance of the property, you know, or whether or not you can do certain things on the property, there could be conflicts there, um, but that's something that your contractors that you hire and stuff uh, should be able to discern or know. But overall for county specific homeowner association, regulations or rules, I'm not aware of a lot of them, not to say that it couldn't occur. This question that just came in, I think is good. Is there any uniformity required for all HOAs? Yes, <laughs> there is some uniformity. Let me see if I printed, and that's in the Homeowner Association Act. So it requires all homeowners associations to do certain things. Let me see if I can pull up the report on the last page of the report oh it's the how do they know what they can or cannot do so it's not the homeowner association act so let me see i'm going to try and share my screen
and go to our ditty on the Homeowners Association Act. Under our education section, we have top five questions. It's a YouTube, FAQs, before you buy in a HOA, what they can and cannot do, things of that nature. But then we have the law outlines in the section below. And so for the Homeowners Association Act, can you see it, Bailey? Yes. Am I sharing properly? Okay. I always get confused between the parameters for sharing on Zoom and go to webinar. Okay. So the Homeowners Association Act has some general applicability to anybody who is a homeowners association. So number one is a filing requirement. So any governing documents that existed before the homeowners association law went into effect, which is that May 17th of 2018, had to have been recorded in the county clerk of court or register of deeds office by January 10th, 2019 to have been enforceable. So then if those documents get uh, amended or if there are new governing documents, rules and regulations that go into place during a year, they need to be filed in the county by January 10th of each year following their adoption or amendment. So that includes the declaration, the master deeds, and the bylaws. So all homeowners associations have to comply with that. There's also an access to documents provision that must be complied with. Rules, regulations, and amendments. So HOAs have to make their rules, regs, and amendments available to members upon request unless they are posted in a conspicuous place in a common area or available on a web page is maintained by the HOA and the member can download them. And then respond when responding to a request, you can send them via email or through methods that are provided in the bylaws. There's also a requirement that homeowners associations comply with certain budget and membership list provisions that are found in the Nonprofit Corporation Act for the purpose of letting homeowners inspect um, and copy the association's budget and membership lists. And then there is a meeting notice requirement 48 hours in advance of a meeting where there's going to be a decision to raise the annual budget. And you have to make that notice in a conspicuous place, in a common area, internet website, email, or methods provided in the bylaws. And then all home buyers must get that disclosure that we talked about through LLR saying that that property is a part of the homeowners association. That law also provides magistrate's courts to hear monetary disputes involving the HOA in the amount of less than 7,500. And then again, has the complaint processing and reporting requirements for our office. So those are the baseline for all homeowners associations on what you have to comply with. And then if you're a nonprofit, you have to comply with that law and those provisions. If you're a horizontal property regime, you have to comply with that law and those provisions as well. And the last question more, to come in. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, there's more on our website. And I think, you know, we do every year when we do our general homeowner association act, we do a webinar on the laws as well around that same time. And so there should be a playlist on our YouTube that I'm sure has the homeowner association information that you could go there and we break down each of those laws or kind of go over the highlights of them. Yes, we do. We have uh, this year, this past year's HOA law webinar is up on our youtube channel if you go to our webinar playlist that will be the one that we send out in the um in the press release that will be going out shortly uh the last question that's come in is uh do you send the yearly reports to hoas i can answer this we don't have a list there's not a list of all hoas in south carolina uh, so we cannot send out the reports to all hoas uh, but i mean it is available to the public so uh, we put it on our website, it is there. Um, and anyone and everyone can look at it <laughs> whenever they please. I'm so glad you said it. That was the issue. That was the, the issue that I was gonna bring up over that last question that I couldn't remember um, when somebody was asking about surveying homeowners associations and such is yeah, there is no filing or regulation requirement um, for a, a particular state entity or agency for homeowners associations. So we don't know how many homeowners associations exist. We don't know how many are nonprofit corporations because unless you use homeowners association in your name, we don't know that you're theoretically a homeowners association either. So there is no across the board filing for a homeowners association. So we can't tell you who's out there and how many of them are out there. A question came in that I think, um, uh, this is a question we get a lot. It's about 
the members information, especially when it comes to the Homeowners Association Act of posting the members or giving out list of members information. So concerning posting of members information, uh, they're concerned about being careful of disclosing PII uh, that's not already in the public domain. Um, so we get this question a lot. I know I get a lot of emails from people in HOAs about, you know, what information should we disclose and should we not disclose <laughs> when it comes to people's PII on an HOA? Yeah, so as far as the membership list, I'm trying to remember how specific they are with the information that has to be in there. But theoretically, I mean, somebody's um, personal identifying information, social security numbers, dates of birth, financial account numbers, um, things of that nature, if they were to be released by a homeowners association could be considered a security breach under state law. Um, and debt collection law would also apply if you you can't put up a list of people who are behind on their assessments and say all these people are behind on their assessment because that could violate debt collection laws uh, as well. So those are the two things that pop to mind. Um, but I would again encourage folks to look at the membership list provisions in the Nonprofit Corporation Act to see what information, if it's specific about putting putting out there. But otherwise, I mean, protecting people's personal information, which can include property addresses, right? It can include, include telephone numbers and emails. The Supreme Court has said um, state agencies can't release that information with Freedom of Information Act requests because there is still an expectation of privacy. So, you know, if folks have that expectation of privacy, you certainly want to um, respect, respect that. And also like for the information that you need to collect, only collect what you need to collect um, and then only release, yeah, the limited amounts that need to be released. Keep it in mind state law that may prohibit the release. This is a good question. Are realty companies required to tell buyers about HOAs? So it's not, well, I, that gets into some areas. I was gonna say it's not necessarily the responsibility of the realtor as much as it is the seller. So if the seller has a seller's agent and they're completing that property disclosure that we mentioned, the South Carolina Residential Property Disclosure Statement, um, I don't know if the burden falls on the realtor, if the burden only falls on the seller. Um, I think it's a seller responsibility, uh, but there could be an agency relationship. So it could become the responsibility of a seller's agent, but I'm not 100% sure, because uh, that's not an area that we administer and enforce. But I know at least the seller is responsible for letting somebody know that the property is part of a homeowners association. Agreed. It, I, I'm pretty sure it's the seller's responsibility. Okay, so there, so there are other questions that are very specific that we will try and follow up with you. And again, we may not have an answer for you because we may not be able to answer it for you, um, but we will follow up with you if we did not answer your question specifically, but that's the last question that we can answer that came up. Yeah, I'm just floating through. One more time, just to make sure. Y'all ask great questions. Thank you for making this such an interactive webinar. I think this is one of the most top popular topics that we certainly present on and we appreciate everybody's participation and, um, and asking, asking the questions. A question just came in of, do HOAs have to share budget information? Yeah, so there's annual budget information and general, let's see, let's go back to that requirement under the Nonprofit Corporations Act that applies to everybody. So there's, you, they, yes, you should be able to get a copy of the association's budget under the Nonprofit Corporations Act provision that all homeowners associations have to comply with. All right, that looked like it's it. Yep, I think so. All right. Again, thank you all for taking time out of your day 
uh, to join us on our, our five-year anniversary report. Can't believe it's been five years that we've been doing this for five years. Time flies when you're having fun. Please make sure to check out the reports page, the education page, our old videos. Um, if you have any additional questions, they may be helpful. And as Bailey mentioned, we'll be getting this information out this afternoon and distributing it to the media and on our social media site. So feel free to forward that on to folks that you think may be interested. So with that, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.